I came to Caltech as a graduate student in, in the summer of 1956. You may compute where that falls in your life. <laughs> I was a graduate student until uh, the, the summer of 1961. During my first year, I studied my four classes and attended colloquia to begin to learn what graduate school was like. I joined the Kellogg Radiation Lab during 1957 after taking the nuclear physics course at 8 o'clock in the morning, mind you, uh, from William A. Fowler, who was a morning dynamo, along with about 20 other graduate students taking the course. Uh, Willie was busy filling the blackboards when we came in, so we were too busy copying notes to relax. He turned and stared at late arrivals. I loved nuclear physics, and I worshipped Willie, as so many did. I told him I'd like to do research with him, uh, and he said he would officially take me on only if I made a good grade in his course. That motivated me to work hard. My PhD thesis had two distinct parts, and they were both intimately related to the S process, which had been described in B squared F H, which was just published the year I began working with him. Willie was concerned that carbon 13 uh, might burn too rapidly at hydrogen burning. Uh, owing to a state in nitrogen-14 that had been suggested by an inelastic proton scattering experiment off of nitrogen-14. So, after some preparatory learning how to do things, I measured the alpha groups to the final state of nitrogen-14 from the reaction N15 helium-3-alpha nitrogen-14 on the 3 million volt Vandegraaff accelerator. It had enough energy for nitrogen plus helium. This was a great learning experience. Those compound states located above 7.55 MeV in nitrogen-14 could be low energy resonances for C13P gamma. That would destroy C13 in hydrogen burning in stars and along with it, the hope for the C13 neutron source in helium burning. I found a good alpha spectrum in this experiment on the Vandegraaff, but none of the compound states were deadly to C13. I loved it all. It was just a lot of fun. Decades later, at the retirement banquet for Roberto Lovino in Torino, I quipped, my experiment saved the S process. <laughs> Showing my nitrogen 14 alpha spectrum to Tom Lauritsen, who looked intently at my data book, he eventually offered me a cigar. And then said, when both of us were puffing away, come with me. I was thrilled watching him remove a threatening state that had been suggested by Protan in Elastic Scouting I could, that I could not find that state and enter the levels that I had found under the large 2 by 3 foot master energy level diagrams of the light nuclei which he maintained in the walls outside his office. From there they would go to nuclear physics for their energy levels of the light nuclei. Tommy's ceremonial style impressed me that I had altered human knowledge. It was published in 1962. I was 26 years old, barely shaving, but marked for life. <laughs> this was to be my first and last experiment in the nuclear lab, but I didn't know that. Unknown to me, Kellogg Lab was at a crossroad, so I was too. What physics do you do with three small vandegraaffs? Willie and C.C. Lauritsen had already made the decision to study the rates of thermonuclear reactions in stars, where an astronomically large rate of collisions made improbable reactions frequent enough 
to maintain the stellar temperature. Uh, first slide, please. The second part, I put the time dependence into the S process calculations. The generic time dependent equation up there, there are about 150 of those linked to each other, as you all know. Uh, and if the, if the time derivative is zero, then sigma n is a constant everywhere. That was what we got in v squared fh, but they couldn't go much beyond that. Uh, next. I discarded dn dt equals zero by using distinct neutron fluences and comparing the abundance distributions sigma a and a, which from my thesis here, 1961 thesis are labeled by the number of neutron captures per IRC nucleus. We could not calculate this on a computer in 1960. So I used a method based on Laplace transforms. I was so proud of that because I had just learned it in the course I took at Caltech in mathematical methods. This showed, among other things, that barium to iron over abundances greater than 10 must result from iron C nuclei being converted into barium. But in addition to all these individual, and those are just some of them, uh, it was clear that none of them looked like the solar system abundance, that the solar system abundance didn't look like a superposition of them. And so I made a uh, parameterization, if you will, of the S process, that the number of iron exposed to a certain flux tau and a range D tau is an exponentially decreasing uh, function of the fluids. And that became kind of the standard parameterization for almost two decades until it could be replaced by a working two-shell source AGD model. After my PhD in 1961, Willie called me into his office. ONR support of laboratory nuclear physics, the Office of Naval Research, had supported Kellogg forever, had dried up. This had to do with congressmen, of course. But Willie had good news. He'd obtained the first ever Kellogg grant from the National Science Foundation, and it was for nucleosynthesis in STARS to support four research associates for two years each. He asked me to join that group. What luck. That's what I most wanted to do after my thesis. The other three research associates were Iko Eben and Richard Sears in computation of stellar structure and evolution. And this is when I learned how interesting the vast physics of stars could be. And John McCall in weak interactions in stars. Willie impishly named this program SINS, S-I-N-S, Stellar Interiors and Nucleosynthesis. Willie loved to play on words. So my path changed after my thesis to 100% nucleosynthesis. At that time, my friend Philip A. Seeger was a student of Willie's constructing a mass law for our process studies with Willie. And I joined that by suggesting that we build a time-dependent R process calculation and improve the abundance division between S and R nuclei in the abundance chart. Phil and I discussed a lot how to set this up, finally adopting constant neutron flux conditions for varying times and comparing the results for different times. We published the first time dependent study of the R process in 1965 in Abdi Seeger Bowering Clayton. It showed that the R process abundances in the solar system, nothing about other stars yet, but in the solar system, demand a superposition of neutron, of neutron fluences. No single history yields all three R process peaks. Well, I've been lucky to happen into graduate school at the right time and the right place to discover these time-dependent features of a heavy element nucleosynthesis, despite not having had 
a good dynamic model of how either the S process or the R process actually happened. Uh, next, 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 and next. Okay. <coughs> At the end of Willie's two year NSF grant at a going away celebration in Kellogg, there's a picture from July 1963 on the left. End of an era is written on the cake because so many of us were leaving at that time. Only a few seen here. I'm at a crossroads myself of finding a faculty position. Rice University had just announced a new department of space science, as they called it, inspired by the location of Johnson Space Center in Houston. They had no students yet, they had not taught a single course, and we had to build a new building on the campus. There I am building it myself. <laughs> I was unsure what space science later called space physics, at my suggestion, would be. Chairman Alex Dessler assured me that the physics of stars and nucleosynthesis was an appropriate foundation subject for our department. I took that job at Rice. Things hummed along smoothly at Rice for three years. I had good graduate students, such as Stan Woosley and Mike Howard, who, like many others, had been physics majors at Rice previously and decided to stay there for graduate school. My course in stellar evolution and nucleosynthesis had good enrollments because a good fraction of the students took it, and I was well along in formulating a textbook that I planned to be like none other. I'd even begun discussion with Dave Arnett about joining our department once he became available. Then Willie Fowler wrote me an astonishing letter. He asked me to return to Caltech. They would pay, he said, for a year to write a joint monograph with Willie and Fred on nucleosynthesis and stars. Next slide. Could I take that crossroad back to Caltech for one year after only three years at Rice? Not an easy decision. Lots to work out. For one thing, my contract as an assistant professor did not grant years off. I needed support from Rice of the venture, and they gave me a one-year leave of absence. It was daunting with a rented home, two small boys, one needing kindergarten, the need to rent a new house, all for just a year, and so on. The photo at the right showed the Rice faculty in our department two years later after I returned <coughs> with Dave Arnett pictured in the front. Oh, I have a pointer here. There's Dave Arnett, and there I am, pictured at the front. It all worked out. I decided, however, that writing, my writing goal should be to complete my textbook rather than write a monograph with William Fred. That was a crossroad for sure for me. I had to make that clear to them, so I wrote Willie a letter. Willie replied, making it easy for me, responding, again, by letter. Everything was by letter. We didn't have any email. Phones didn't offer a good, reliable record of important conversations. So we were all letter writers. Willie's saying, you and the family just come and finish your book. Ours can wait. It never came. Friends suggest we go to England for opening of this new institute. That changed everything. Next view, please. On the left, Willie Fowler and Fred Hoyle sit in Willie's office while I and Bob Weiger, this is 1966, stand examining an orange age preprint of their paper at Bob Wagoner's with Fred on nucleosynthesis in the Big Bang. I can tell you that Fred Hoyle was very proud of this paper on the Big Bang, for those of you that think he hated the Big Bang. 
in March 1967, actually on my 32nd birthday, I took this wonderful photograph of Fred outside Kellogg with uh, Troop Hall, now demolished, standing like a, singing like a crown on Fred's head. Good planet. Uh, Fred's 52 years old now. Nice photo. A memorable crossroad for me when he invited me at that time to come to Cambridge for the next five years in summers to offer guidance to student researchers in nucleosynthesis in Cambridge. My quick telephone calls to Rice administrators got encouragement. They saw a win-win situation, so we did it. A month later, we would pack our clothes, give away our acquired goods, and sail from the 42nd Street docks in New York to Southampton, UK, on the Cunard Line's original Queen Elizabeth. In 1967, very few Americans had traveled to Europe. Today, we all have. Beginning in the second summer, I would fulfill my responsibility to Fred by bringing my graduate students to Rice. Stan Woosley and Mike Howard were the first students to come with me in the second summer. This gave birth to an annual pilgrimage of people from Rice that came to be called in Cambridge the Rice Mafia. Houston's. But before sailing, I had a project in nuclear theory that I wanted to finish. I was working on an idea for a neutron tunneling model of helium-3 plus helium-3. Reaction would happen in hydrogen burning at the lowest energy. I claimed that S of E would rise markedly at low energy, owing to the neutron tunneling mechanism perhaps solving the solar neutrino problem by reducing the amount of helium-3 in hydrogen burning and therefore also reducing the beryllium-7 and boron-8 produced neutrinos. Fortunately for me, a young man named Robert McCready May arrived from Sydney and had moved in to share my office in Kellogg. Bob found my idea such a good one that he was inspired to approve the calculation a lot since he already was an established expert in reaction theory, though my own young age. <coughs> so in view six here, I show our computed helium-3 plus helium-3 uh, cross-section, factor S of E, which I later found grows too gradually at low energy to solve the solar new problem. And it's a good thing, because that wasn't the solution anyhow. <laughs> We did publish that neutron tunneling model in FJ in 1968. Martin Schmidt had just, just dropped in to talk about QSL absorption lines. It wasn't planned, he just came in in suits. That's how it was 50 years ago. I tried to look convincing. I still do. <laughs> I wish in many ways I'd taken this photo or had it taken with Robert May instead of with William Martin, because as famous as William and Martin were, my co-author and office mate was so quickly to become one of the celebrated scientists of our time because of his turn onto a crossroad into mathematical ecology. U7. This is 50 years later, as you can tell. <laughs> this is the Manchester Warehouse District near Piccadilly Station. We, we were there, Nancy and I were fulfilling our hobby looking at historic architecture. And Nancy suddenly cried out, there's one of the, this is a warehouse building, a piece of it. There's a lot of nice detail for buildings that old. When Nancy said, look, graffiti, I looked, I'll read it. Chaos theory. X at, t at time t plus 1 equals k times x at time t times 1 minus x at time t. Robert May, 1975. This actually was not chaos theory, but it was a, an equation that Bob had developed 
on animal population dynamics and the relationship between complexity and stability in natural communities. When I talked to Bob at Ed Saltpeter's retirement party at Cornell in 1984, he told me he was then professor of population biology at Princeton, that his new ideas had been received very well. It's a hard transition to picture going from nuclear scattering theory in Sydney to population biology at Princeton, but Bob did it. Next, I read of Bob appointed professor at Oxford, where he became president of the Royal Society and received a lifetime endowed Royal Society professorship to use when and where he chose, and he chose Oxford, where he is a professor at Merton College. Crossroads can make you famous, or they can be dead ends. Back briefly to nucleosynthesis at Caltech in 1967. The largest puzzle for us then was the nucleosynthesis of the abundant nuclei between silicon and iron. The evolution made it up to cure silicon-28 okay, but how did further heating get to Hoyle's E process? View A. I had the good luck in 1967 of discovering the silicon-burning quasi-equilibrium, QSC. It's pictured here on the left. Each abundance is shown is in equilibrium with silicon-28 under exchange of protons, neutrons, and alphas. And every reaction link, for example, argon-37, alpha-N, calcium-40, proceeds at the same rate as its inverse reaction. I discovered this while puzzling over the extremely slow change extremely slow change in this abundance distribution in spite of the destructive reaction rates being much faster than the rate of change in the distribution. The abundances are essentially frozen by inverse reactions. And they, the, the frozen abundance shifts only slowly going to a leap from the freezing reactions. The pattern is frozen. On a longer time scale, this pattern shifts from pure silicon-28 to nickel-56. But it did so by this leakage. The red abundances are radioactive. Uh, nickel-56 and nickel-57 nickel became very important. Titanium-44 was very important. But it didn't seem a problem just then, since for nucleosynthesis yields, we just added their abundances to those of their daughters to get the abundance. Within a year, I realized that the radioactive abundances were extremely important in their own right. The photo of me with Willie Fowler on the right is in the hut in the field of sheep on the observatory grounds in Cambridge. That was our office for the summer since Biota, that's Institute of Theoretical Astronomy, construction was not finished. View 9. Back to Rice at Summer's End, after this summer, in 1967. We'd hired Robert C. Haynes, pictured here, who built a gamma ray detector to float beneath a balloon. It had a central sodium iodide scintillator for measuring gamma rays, and its field of view was set up by an active cylindrical anti-coincidence collimator. You can see the photomultiplier tubes viewing the outside collimator. This simple detector found 511 radiation gammas from the galactic center, owing to beta plus annihilations there. I had published a 1965 paper just before that on detecting the gamma radiation from our process degree, but that was just went to the junkie. Jerry Fishman was a grad student in 1968, working with Bob Haynes on this gamma ray telescope. That's Jerry Fishman of the, of the Batsy detector on later gamma ray observatory. 
He asked in Sin's class if silicon QSC was radioactive. And I, thought, I thought immediately of what he's thinking. I said, of course it is. And so we calculated its gamma ray spectrum. This resulted in the paper Clayton, Colgate, and Fisherman in 1969. This view includes some prominent <coughs> gamma rays emitted after the titanium 44 decay scanion, or after nickel 56 to cobalt 56 and cobalt 56 to iron. Ones that became new targets for a new field of gamma ray astronomy. And our 1969 paper was chosen for the centennial of the American Astronomical Society as one of 50 most significant of the 20th century because of its ramifications. I was invited to become co-investigator on OSI as one of the instruments, the Oriented Simulation Spectrometer Experiment, somewhat like Bob Haynes' experiment, only more sophisticated, which was a lot of work, and to do it I'd have to relinquish several interests nuclear astrophysics crossroads do that to you. View 10, pictured at left, is a preview. Astronaut J. Apt here in the space shuttle Atlantis Bay on 5th of April 1991 with CGRO still attached by an arm. I decided to do everything I could to get GRO funded. Uh, right about two years earlier, we're working at NASA on a letter to the Space Science Board of the National Academy of Science, arguing for approval of CGRO as a line item in the national budget. Those high-level negotiations were necessary with a budget item as, as big as GRO was. We have here Ruben Ramadi distinguished Goddard astrophysicist, Don Niffen, Ruben is the co-author of the letter with me, there I am, and Don Niffen was to become the uh, project scientist. You can see at the left that the letter worked, at least it didn't hurt anything. View 11. Pictured left was the Aussie Theory Team in 1990, work at NRL prior to the launch. Many such meetings were needed. I traveled to Washington a lot over a period of half a dozen years. And at right are myself, the co-I on Aussie, Jim Kirpis, the PI on Asi who got his start as a postdoc with Bob Haynes' balloon experiment, and Mark Lysing, professor at Clifford. We're analyzing the Asi data at this moment from supernova 1987A at Clemson for the 122 kilovolt gamma ray line from cobalt 57 decay. In spite of four years of decay since supernova 87, the decay of the cobalt 57, 57 270 day cobalt, we saw it clearly, five sigma, in two observing periods of 10 to the fifth second, one near 1,620 days, and again near 1,775 days. The cobalt 57 was only one third as abundant as expected from assuming that radiogenic luminosity was powering the light curve, as many thought it was. So I'm extremely proud of the precision of Aussie's measurement and of my pursuing it for two decades from my 1974 prediction until its 1993 discovery. That's published in AFJ 399 L41. We described the delayed luminosity theory to explain the excess volumetric power from cobalt 57. CGRO deorbited in June 2000 after nine years of data. Finally, please. A 1974 crossroad in 
meantime, it led me into meteoritics. I wasn't a meteoritics, I was a nuclear physicist turned Gamma's rock. My idea was that the supernova too condensed dust during expansion of the radioactive ejecta, which then resides in the ISM and may be found in meteorites perhaps, if it's possible to measure the isotopic ratios in small grains. This is an artist depiction on the cover of my book, Isotopes in the Cosmos. But we've got the real thing in the next view. The question of how is how, this is a silicon carbide grain, and it's clearly a grain from a supernova, from the isotopes of the elements that, that they're in the grain. They're, they're supernova isotopes, not, not the interplanetary, not interstellar medium isotopes. My first paper is reduced. Next view. The silicon carbide grains from supernovae found in the units. Next view. It's called a silicon carbide X grain. In its calcium, the 44 calcium isotope is overabundant because it's been enriched by titanium decay. It decayed after the grain formed. The extinct radioactive titanium 44 was trapped during condensation. Well, that wasn't known. I was just, I just predicted it. Those, my first papers on this were rejected because they were sent to meteoritics referees rather than astrophysicists. Famous, powerful ones who resented a novice suggesting explanations of puzzles and meteorites. Later, however, I was in 1991 awarded the, the 1991 Leonard Medley Meteorological Society when observations of such stardust grains as this became possible and their isotopes confirmed my basic idea. That gross work was long ago now, but clearly not forgotten. An active forefront of this today is identifying the type of star the stardust grains have come from on the basis of isotopic compositions of its elements and of the chemical plausibility of its condensation there. All that takes an awful lot of science work to get that data. Marco Pignatari's talk here at this meeting will be an example of this. In 1998, I discovered that meteoritics and astronomy both badly need a theory about how carbon dust condenses within oxygen rich cork and lap supernova. I took on this task, a big crossroad to my career, worked on it about 20 years with Alexander Del Carno and Wei Hong Liu of Harvard and Brad Meyer of Clemson University, I created a reaction kinetics models using new pathways that are facilitated by the radioactive changes in carbon to oxygen equilibrium caused by the gamma rays in the supernova interiors. In about a dozen papers, we showed that graphite could condense along kinetic paths in a cooling gas having more oxygen than carbon, violating an old astrochemical rule of thumb. Well, I thank you for inviting me to speak to you about some origins of our discipline. I would only say keep your eyes open for large but productive scientific detours. <laughs>